I'm your host, Dr. W.F. Strong, and this is Brownsville Matters. And I'm really excited today because I'm going to get to talk to my old friend, Dr. Tony Savaletta. And he is, to my mind, the world's leading expert on curanderismo. But we're not going to talk just about that and his many books on the subject. We're also going to talk about his long life from boyhood to where he is today, right here in Brownsville. He has an interesting perspective on the region and Mexico. So, Savalet is in the house. (laughs) That's right. You know, one of the things I used to love about your stories uh, when, you know, we've known each other 35 years. That's right. And we used to... You know, a thousand years ago, we would travel Mexico when we were young and free. But one of the things I always enjoyed about hanging out with you was you would talk about growing up in Brownsville, about your, your life as a boy. That's right. Uh, and, and how different it was from uh, the generations that came after you. So I wanted you to, to you grew up on Levy Street? I grew, up on, I grew up on Levy Street, uh-huh. West, West Levy. First, when we moved... My father mustered out of the Marine Corps after Korea, and and then he convinced my mother, I guess, to come to Brownsville. And my grandmother, his mother, lived on West Levy, about uh, Third or Fourth Street, mm-hmm. and we lived there. And then and then uh, I grew up really on Lakeside. The house that was there that we lived in, he he bought and moved to Lakeside. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if you know where that is, Lakeside yeah. Boulevard. Okay, and that's and so I really on an acre. I grew up on an acre in in uh, in West Brownsville. I've lived almost all my entire life in West Brownsville. I that's live on West Levy today. So within about a square mile, you grew up and you spent most of your life. That's there. right. But and, you and traveled widely by, just, by choice. That, that's been your base of operations. Yes, it has been. Because I don't know anybody really who's traveled more widely in Mexico than you have. All of Mexico. All of Mexico, All of Mexico right. and most of Central America and the mm-hmm. Caribbean. Well, before we get into your uh, work as a historian of Curanderismo, mm-hmm. I wanted to, again, focus on Brownsville, because this program, we, we'd like to focus on uh, particularly the Lower Rio Grande Valley and sure. how it's changed over the years and where it's headed, you know, the future, too, as you would yeah. see it. Where was North Brownsville when you grew up? There was no North there was Brown- no. <laughs> there was no, no. There was no North Brownsville. There was West Brownsville, which began at Palm Boulevard and mm-hmm. continued up about 15 or 16 blocks to the military highway. And there wasn't even a Boca Chica. Boca Chica came later, Boca Chica Boulevard. Uh-huh. Uh, so, so really, it was that was all farm country. Mm-hmm. There was really no North Brownsville. So all this area where the the mall is Sunrise Mall, that was just all country. It was all country. Uh, all the way to, all to the way, San Benito. All the way to San Benito, that's right. Yeah. So what amazes you today when you drive from Brownsville well, to San Benito? You know, what it's, it's, what it's, blows your mind? Yeah, <laughs> it's so expansive. It, it, I think about it now and then because I get lost. Uh-huh. And uh, I'll have to go to some neighborhood that I'm not familiar with. And I have to use the GPS to find it. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm, what, you know, out there. How did this happen? Yeah, where did this all come from? Mm-hmm. So Brownsville has... Outgrown me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you also I'm, have. I'm still lo- located. I'm a mm-hmm. I'm a small town West Brownsville mm-hmm. boy, and still am. And when you grew up there, uh, you ran around everywhere on your own, right? Yes. You went to Mexico even. On yes, your own, oh, all the boy. time. All the time. Mm-hmm. I would tell my father because I had family, uh-huh. a lot of family in Matamoros, and I, I I was fortunate to live to be raised in an enormous family, lots of cousins, aunts and uncles. And I remember when Matamoros first got the bowling alley, which is where the building is still there, but there's no bowling alley. But there was a bowling alley right next to the old, what we call the old bridge. Mm-hmm. And so I would tell my father, I'm going to the bowling alley, and I'd get on my bike, <laughs> and I'd go to the bowling alley. So and then, and then... Uh, so you'd ride your bike across the bridge? Yeah. Sure. With all that traffic? There was no traffic. No, there was no traffic. No, ah. there was no traffic. Very little traffic. Um, then when I got older in my teenage years, then it was bars. Uh-huh. 
and my buddies and I, we, we, I won't say we were wild because I never got into any kind of trouble, but we did, we did some pretty crazy things. And so it was bars and boys town, mm-hmm. you know, I didn't have a girlfriend. I was a football player. So that after the football games on Friday night and we'd all, pile, I had a car, my yeah. father bought me a car. So we'd all pile in my car and we'd go to boys town, mm-hmm. which was a tremendous thing. I've always been an anthropologist at heart. Mm-hmm. And my journeys to Boys Town were to observe. Mm-hmm. I can tell you that quite honestly. And just to see how it worked and what was going on. And I right, had but, of, but were you consciously aware of this being a yeah. difference for you for you, as opposed to what your friends were experiencing? Were, were you a, a different observer? No, well, I don't know. I, uh-huh. I, they never voiced that. Uh-huh. So I really don't know whether they, you know, they were... I doubt very seriously if they were thinking and observing yeah, I doubt it. what yeah. I was. Yeah, I doubt yeah. it. So you, but I saw so many things. I saw a man uh, whose daughter was going to school at Texas Southwest College with us. I saw him machine gun down in front of his cabaret on the main street, you know, just blah, 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 blah. And that was into him. We never saw her again, so I don't know whatever happened, but... But I saw that, and lots, lots of fights and shootings, and. And this was out at Baghdad Beach, out that vicinity, uh, or where not was that, this located? Yeah, not that far, uh-huh. but it was definitely outside of Matamoros, mm-hmm. so that mm-hmm. you left Matamoros behind. It was, mm-hmm. it was ethereal, because you you left the the urban Matamoros behind, and then for several miles you were just in dark, total oh, yeah, darkness, mm-hmm. and cornfields and mm-hmm. cotton fields. And then off to the right, there was a glow. Mm. <laughs> and as you approached that glow, and there was one main street, and mm. as you approached that glow, you could see the the, the lights of the cabarets. Mm. And it was just like from dusk to dawn. Wow. That's why that movie attracts me so much, because it was exactly like that. And I'm sure there were plenty of devils in there, too. Mm. Yeah. I, it's interesting. As you tell it, I can see you seeing it again. Oh, absolutely. I can see you seeing it in your face. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so it's a red light district that had a glow. Yes. How, how appropriate. Yeah, because there was a, there were cornfields, so you couldn't oh. see until you, until you really came right up on the turn off of the highway and down that road, dirt road, you really couldn't see what was out there except this, this, this glow, this mm. halo. It's amazing. And after you saw this guy machine gunned, you yeah. you you went back still. Sure, <laughs> sure. And then there was this one time. So you figured you weren't in danger because you weren't involved. Well, in I'll anything. tell you about that. Okay. But uh, my best friend's father, and still best friend's father, was he was the chief of police in Matamoros. In Matamoros. And my okay. father's best friend was the mayor of Matamoros. Mm. So imagine. I mean, we we didn't realize it until later, but we were always being watched mm-hmm. and protected. And protect, oh, By the time okay. I got home, my father already had a report. Oh, you, oh yeah, oh, and, and he was supportive. Uh-huh. Yeah, he just he said, said, you know, well, just be careful, mm-hmm. you know, don't do anything stupid. Mm-hmm. And I never did. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that that's part of my... So you trace your roots as an anthropologist to those days where you learned to observe another Before culture. Before that, let me tell you, my, my grandmother and grandfather, Zavaleta, had a farm uh, across from Progreso mm-hmm. and out in that region, mm-hmm. uh, Nuevo Progreso. Mm-hmm. And every summer, they were they were cotton farmers, so every, every summer when it came time to harvest the cotton, the truckloads of braceros would come up from southern Tamaulipas or even southern Mexico to pick cotton. And there were no bracero houses for them like there were here. They just made their encampments on the ground in the field. Mm. And that's where I wanted to be. So when I was out there and I was all, you know, when, when school was getting ready to end in May, I already had packed up my BB gun, plenty of BBs and a knife and everything I needed <laughs> to keep me going for the summer. That's wonderful. Yeah. And I, I slept on the ground in this encampment of people. Mm-hmm. The women were cooking and making uh-huh. tortillas and beans and the, the men were out picking cotton and I listened to their stories 
uh, I didn't, I was a little widito, you know, like uh-huh. you would have been. Uh-huh. And I didn't know until many years later that my grandmother had a woman watching me, taking care of me, mm-hmm. watching over me. Mm-hmm. So I've always had guardian angels, but I, did, I didn't know that. And I picked cotton and my grandfather required that I picked cotton and dragged the bag. It was a long, I don't know if you're familiar with those oh, bags. Yeah. You remember yeah. those long bag, yeah. cotton bags? Dra- dragged that bag back to the his re- where he had his table because mm-hmm. he had a big, um, I can see it in my mind's eye, a scale, mm-hmm. and then on the table he had piles of coins and a pistol, okay? <laughs> and so then they would weigh the cotton and they'd tell him, you know, 20 libras or kilos mm-hmm. or whatever, and he would pay him right there, coin, pay him coin. Per bag. Yeah, and and uh, that's the way it worked. Wow. Like, uh, my grandfather was a man of the, of the 19th century, really. Uh-huh. Yeah, he, when I was in high school, he was uh, an already a very old man. But uh, those those are the wonderful memories I have of the farm, of West Brownsville growing up there. Did, do you remember your hands being torn up from the cotton? Sure, absolutely. The cotton, yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah. That's what everybody always says when they talk about cotton. No, it's true. I saw it done. I never picked cotton. I was a watermelon guy, which yeah. I think I preferred. Uh, it didn't tear up your hands so much. It was hard work, but... Uh, yeah. It was very interesting. So, th- so you were actually an early ethnographer. You were yes. out actually a pure ethnographer living. I think so because mm. when I got to UT and took my first anthropology courses, you know, I would tell those stories mm-hmm. and I'd write them in my papers. And when my one of my first, very first anthropology professors was Américo Paredes. Oh, really? And, I yes, didn't know that. Yeah, and I didn't know who he was, uh, but he knew who I we was. Were, okay. And so he would, in those early days, he would joke with me and make uh, uh, fun of me in a positive way. You know, finally I discovered that he was a Brownsville boy and grew up just right down the street from my father and my uncles. That was a wonder. I was a wonderful education. And I guess you didn't realize when you first had him how big he was, how important he was as a no. scholar. Well, he wasn't thin. He became later. He became uh, later. Okay. That's right. But no, I, I, well, we, you know, I was a part of the whole Chicano movement at UT, one of the mm-hmm. first ones, and and he was our mentor and our hero, and we advocated for him to be the first director of the Mexican American Studies Center because mm-hmm. the, the UT didn't want him. Mm-hmm. They didn't want him, but he, we put him in office, and and. Those were wonderful days. He played his guitar in class. Yeah, oh, and absolutely. Sang songs. Yeah, and sang. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, but what did he sing? He was teaching ballads. You, uh, Mexican he sang American ballads, ballads and corridos, uh-huh. and and songs that he wrote, like the the ballad of Gregorio Cortez oh, yeah, and others yeah. like that. And he would sing them. And that was made into a movie. Yes. The, the song became a movie, I guess. Yeah. Or, or vice versa. I don't well, know let me tell you about that. When they were putting together. I know I'm making all kinds of noise. <laughs> when they were putting together the the committee for the movie, he was sickly and old, and he chose me. He said, "I want you." They were going to have a, a meeting in Mex in in Washington D.C. to to think about the movie and how they were going to do the movie. And he asked me to go as his representative, so I did that. Uh-huh. And so that's where I met all kinds of people uh, there that have been in the industry, the film industry, all these years, and I met them. And I never benefited from that, but they've always been friends of mine. Well, that's, yeah. a, that's a great honor to yeah, have, I think so. have I think had so. that experience yeah. early yeah. on. And the movie is, you know, you're, you're an anthropologist and an historian, and the movie was to you accurate, accurately told? I don't remember. <laughs> it's been too many it's been years. A long time. It's been a long time. That's been a long time ago. Well, I remember seeing it as uh, I think I was maybe thirty when, yeah. I, when I saw it. I loved yeah. it. Yeah, I was I really into that because when when Zoot Suit, changing uh, the subject, premiered in Hollywood, and I was just a lowly Texas South broke Texas Southwest College professor. <laughs> I, I was in the seventies, but I went to L.A. Mm-hmm. for the for the premiere. Mm-hmm. Of Zoot, of Zoot Suit, really. Yeah, yeah. I think the the thing that struck me about uh, that film, The Ballad of Gregorio Cortez, was that as a gringo, having been raised on 
Anglo films, we'll call it. Yes. Know, Anglo cowboy, uh, Texas Ranger sort of film. So I had always been, you know, taught that they could do no wrong, so to speak, filmically. And so to see this reversed, yeah. it was uh, kind of an epiphany. Oh, that's right. And, Plus, and I was immediately put on his side, you know, within the film. I said, I became his fan. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's interesting. It was. It was very much so. Now, you began traveling Mexico uh, well, to a great you. extent when you were how old? Well, <laughs> I mean, obviously, you've been running over the, across I the border had a an lot. an uncle. But, and an aunt and cousins that lived in Ciudad Victoria mm -hmm. and Monte. Mm -hmm. And one day I, I announced to my, my father, I was driving a, a 54 Mercury. <laughs> that was my car. It was in, I kept in pretty good shape. I announced to my father, who was a pretty serious guy, but tolerant, as I said. I said, this, this weekend I'm going down to Ciudad Victoria to see my cousins. Wow. They had a very attractive daughter. And he looked at me and said, well, okay, be careful. And I went, I went down there I drive by myself. And how old were you? Excuse me? How old were you then? You're 17? No, 16? younger. Younger. Oh, well, wow. 16. <laughs> wow. Drove to Seattle, by Victoria. By yourself. By myself. Visited with my aunts and uncles and, the, and uh, my cousins. And then drove back. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh. So that's that's always been a part of me. And then... Would you have let one of your sons drive down there? No 16? way. <laughs> it's no. interesting, isn't it? I would re <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't. It's a different Mexico yeah. today. Or even when they were even growing up. Even when they up. were growing up, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no. I wouldn't. But then I spent... Uh, I began driving all over Mexico. I've been in every state mm -hmm. in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Really love Mexico. In fact, the last ten years or so have been terribly depressing for me because I can't drive in Mexico. It's too dangerous, yeah. and I can't take my wife and child to Mexico because it's too dangerous. Mm -hmm. So I just don't go. And now I'm I'm probably not able, not capable, just hobbling around. So I mm -hmm. I haven't been even to San Miguel, which mm -hmm. I mean you can fly down there, yeah. but I, I haven't done it. And even going across the border here, you don't do that no, much I don't. anymore. No, I, I It's I sad, have, isn't it? It's sad that, that, yeah, that it's that's sad, turned sad. that way. I'll go to my, I'll go to the airport to pick up my comadre from Mexico City when she comes. Uh -huh. I'll do that. Yeah. But I won't, and I, I don't go to Garcia's. I don't drive around in Matamoros like mm -hmm. I used to. Yeah. I mean, Matamoros was a place where I'd go to the hardware stores. Mm -hmm. I'd go. Certainly to the pharmacies, mm -hmm. but I don't. I don't do that anymore. It's been quite a, uh, a sea change it's over the a, last twenty years. It's been a sea change, and it's ever since nine eleven. It's, really. it's very sad. It is sad. I mean, yeah. it was happening a little bit before nine eleven, but never nine eleven was a nail in the coffin. That's when it really switched. I think so. And it took a lot of us. Uh, even for me, I uh, I remember behaving normally for two or three years, uh, just going back and forth, and then. Uh, and then eventually people said, are you crazy? You're going to get kidnapped over there. You well, know, that's you're, right. You're, that was my <laughs> biggest fear. You, you said, plus you're a big gringo. You're, you're would, a prime yeah. target for me. <laughs> I wouldn't have anything to give them. Well, in your, uh, but actually what I wanted to get to is at what point in your travels in Mexico and your, your work as an anthropologist did you say, this, uh, these culanderos are interesting to me yeah. and, and I want to study them. Yes. When did that happen? Well, it started in the cotton fields because I, in, in sitting around the fire and listening to the tales, that was a lot of what they talked about. They talked, that's where I first heard the Nino Fidencio, because many of them actually, because we're talking about the 50s. Right. And so he had just died a few years earlier. They talked about him and visiting his place, and, and, and they talked about witch, witchcraft and witches of which there were plenty around in certain notable towns and villages where there, that where there were uh, witches and like in Tamaulipas, southern Tamaulipas, uh, La Petaca, a place called La Petaca, which is the the suitcase, it was very famous for for witchcraft mm -hmm. and witches. Well, it was both good and white witches and black witches, so to speak. Yes, good both, and both good witches and bright, white witches, and and of course in Veracruz at Catemaco, which is 
sort of like the central place for witches in, in Mexico is Catemaco mm -hmm. in Veracruz. And so I started, uh, because of my interests and wanting to know more, and nobody was really studying that. Mm -hmm. You know, in anthropology, you kind of you kind of pick your field and your area, you carve it out, you study it. Anthropologists are known to study an area for life. Mm -hmm. And of course, I spent 30 years, excuse me, 30 years studying the Nino Fidencio and Espinazo Nuevo León, mm -hmm. where he lived. And so I would hear about, I did a lot in Mexico City. And in fact, I'll tell you a story. I was down, I was in a hotel in Mexico City on about the seventh floor with, with a friend of mine, Acurandera from Brownsville. And we were there to, to do some interviews. And that was a time when Adolfo Constanzo and Sara Aldrete had not been captured, so they were missing. Oh. Right, after the... The Mark Kilroy incident, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. So, we're... we're my, my friend, the Curandera, goes over to the window, and she points to another hotel next door, and she says, that's where they are, right there. Mm -hmm. And I said, who? It's where... Who? And she says, the people that killed the Wadito, the gringo, uh -huh. they're there. And, and, of course, I didn't react to it. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do anything with that, but a couple of days later is when the shootout was and they were captured and so forth. So she was she was very accurate mm -hmm. in her prediction. Mm -hmm. So there's a place in Mexico City called the Sonora, the Mercado Sonora, which is the Sonoran market, which is the, the main herb market and other religious objects market in Mexico, that's where you go. Mm -hmm. And so I've been going there. I, I learned that I could go there. I go every year. I've already been this year. And I can see the new merchandise because from there, from Mexico City, the merchandise, the, the people, the owners of the yerberias mm -hmm. in Brownsville and McAllen, along the border, Laredo, Reynosa, Matamoros, they go there to get the stuff, the new mm -hmm. stuff, and bring it back for sale. And so I had a way of finding out what was new and, and popular, like the Santa Muerte, which mm -hmm. is very popular, very today. popular now, right? Nobody had ever even heard of the Santa Muerte. There was no Santa Muerte, but I knew there was before it came to the border. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the techniques that I uh, developed. Mm -hmm. Well, also, you were uniquely qualified to do this culturally and otherwise. I mean, you could do things. You can't imagine a, a, a white guy from Austin coming down and doing what you did. He well, couldn't even get entry into the culture. Well, that's right. You they, they, trusted. They, they could. Uh -huh. But I remember our professors, when I was studying anthropology at UT, they told us, and I remember very clearly, they said, you, you can't be bashful mm. and be an anthropologist. You have to be in everybody's business. Uh, <laughs> you have to, if you see something you're you're curious about or want to know about, you got to get in there and find out. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've done all these all these years. And mm -hmm. you know, that's I, how I'm, you got into uh, uh, becoming an expert on Nino Fidencio. Well, right? that's exactly right. So let's talk about him. I'm the mm -hmm. expert mm -hmm. on the Nino Fidencio. I just wanted to say that you know I'm generally a pretty affable guy. I'm mm -hmm. not a hard guy to get along with, and and I could speak broken Spanish, I'm much better now, mm -hmm. but I could speak some Spanish. And so I, I, I went right into their, their, their culture. I never was turned down. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so let's talk about Nino Fidencio. Well, Nino, the Nino Fidencio was a healer mm -hmm. who started as a young man, a boy. That's why he's called El Nino Fidencio because when he started healing around, oh, Around 1922 or three, mm -hmm. when he started his practice, he was just a kid. Mm -hmm. And he began to, people began to recognize him as miraculous mm -hmm. and performing miracle cures and healings. And so people began to come from all around. I mean, from Europe. Mm -hmm. They would come all over Mexico and the United States. He was written up in the New York Times. 
Uh, and where, where was he? Where he was, was in a little village called Espinazo, Nuevo Leon, mm -hmm. which is just north, about a, about 100 kilometers north of Monterrey, Monterrey, on the road to Salti, no, on the mm -hmm. road to Monclova. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know Monclova. Monclova I, I know the name, I don't know well, where Well, Monclova is, exactly, is yeah. a, it was a steel mill town, and it's kind of halfway between Monterey and Laredo. Mm -hmm. There's this little railroad stop is what it wow. is. And he developed fame from there? Oh, I mean, Fanta kinda, fantastic yeah, fame, so yeah. that, I mean, I have pictures, uh, I don't have them with me, but at, at the peak of his popularity, which was around 1930, 1928, 29, it was uh, not unusual for there to be 10,000 people there on the desert. 10,000? 10, 10,000 people on the Where desert. Where did they stay? Yeah, yeah, it was unbelievable. Wow. There were new, no hotels, no wow. facilities, but people would come in hope that that they would receive a, a healing or a cure mm -hmm. from the Nino Financio, and many claim to have done exactly that. Mm -hmm. So and then he died. He died in 1938. He was 40 years old. He died. Oh. Uh, I'm not sure what he died of, but I have suspicions. And mm -hmm. and from 19 then during the war years, there was pretty quiet. But after World War II, people began going back. Espinosa became a pilgrimage site. Mm -hmm. And it is today, it's a tremendous pilgrimage site. And there are two fiestas every year, one in October, which is coming up in a couple of weeks, and one in March. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that the fiestas are at the time of the, the, the fall and, and, uh, and spring equinox, mm -hmm. fall and spring. Mm -hmm. And so there's, and then, and then so that place, Espinoso, if it has, if there's a hundred people there, that's a lot. Uh -huh. But during the days of the fiesta, it will swell to thousands, tens of thousands that's of people wild. Yeah. with all kinds of, you can go online and you can see my videos yeah. or other videos that show the fiesta and all the, the movement, the parades and everything. Well, the, do the, does he have um, disciples yeah. uh, who do healing now? He has disciples, many mm -hmm. disciples, mm -hmm. uh, that that follow or his followers, mm -hmm. and those who are able to enter a trance mm -hmm. and channel him. That's the the that's the the thing that attracts people today is that his followers are trance mediums. In Spanish, uh, called materias. Uh -huh. So these trance mediums will channel. Uh, I don't know. Well, it doesn't matter. But you you could look it up later. Uh -huh. uh, channel his spirit. Uh -huh. So his spirit. They bring down his spirit, and then he cures through them uh -huh. in places like Brownsville, San Benito, Harlingen, Edinburgh, uh, Matamoros, Reynosa. Were There's you, little healing centers. Weren't you at one point made a kind of a honorary healer or something? No. And, uh, no I thought I you would, went through a ceremony of some sort. Where well, they, I've done all uh, that. Yeah. yeah, I've done all that because it was required. Uh -huh. But I never practiced because uh, mm -hmm. I, I've always respected, as I was taught, mm -hmm. the boundary between the anthropologist and, uh -huh. the, and mm -hmm. the people we're observing. Mm -hmm. And so... There have been some anthropologists who have, who have gone feral, and gone into those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But I've always stayed separate, so, even though, in order to be validated, I had to do what they wanted me to do. I see. Okay. So I had to make the 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 pilgrimage on my knees, from the tree, the sacred tree, to the tomb. Which is about a quarter of a mile. Oh, that and, hurt. <laughs> yeah, that, it hurt. I bet. Uh, so I had to crawl, and at least I didn't mm. have to carry anything on my back. Mm. But I had to crawl. I could have gone on my belly or my back, but mm. I crawled from the tree up to the tomb. Wow. And how long I was, did that take was, you? Huh? How long did that take you? Do you remember? I don't remember, but not, and not very long uh -huh. because because I was out of it. Oh. I mean, you know, after mm. you. You, you just lose cons mm -hmm. consciousness and you lose 
con- a concept of where you are and what you're doing. Interesting. So it didn't hurt me, yeah. and, but but it, it really, it provided me with the bona fides uh, with that group I see. that I yeah. needed. Yeah, that's I, I can see why that's important. Sure. I remember being once in uh, Mexico City. I don't remember the name of the cathedral, but I remember for some reason on the east side of town, and uh, I remember seeing people uh, doing uh, coming that. on their knees, that's and, right, and walking their hands yeah, and knees, all, doing, all doing sorts the, of promesas. The, the pril- were, pilgrimage, yes, just on that's a right. Sunday morning. I remember there yeah, a lot of them coming right. in blocks and blocks, and other people say, "Oh no, they started ten miles over there." You know? Yeah, well, that's probably true, <laughs> right? So, yeah. so th- you have a book that's all about uh, El Nino. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. So, what's do you have? Oh, it here? This is not it. No, but that, all, I, I have a book called. El Nino Fidencio and the Fidencistas. Oh, yes. And that's mm-hmm. where the whole history mm-hmm. of his life and what mm-hmm. people do and what people do today, it's mm-hmm. all described in there. And it's on, uh, it's on Amazon. You can get it yeah, on Amazon. Yeah, it's on Amazon. All, all my books, books are on have, Amazon. You have uh, three or four books five. now. Five books. But five. Yeah, and you're starting a new one. I'm, five, starting, I'm starting number six. And that, that one is on? Grandmother's Remedies. Oh, <laughs> how wonderful. That, That's great. Grandmother's that Remedies wonderful. of the Border. That because there's good. all kinds of Grandmother's Remedies. For sure. But these are the Border Grandmother's uh-huh. Remedies. So they're the the religious items and artifacts and, and herbs of the Border. Uh-huh. Abuelitas. Abuelitas <laughs> Remedies. What a great title. Yeah, thank you. I like it. I probably have to, you know, as you know, the title has to challenge people and it has to compete with, like for example, mm. that wasn't the original title of this book, of this book huh? but I had to use Curandero so that in Amazon when people are searching and they put they in Curandero, my book comes up, otherwise right. it doesn't. That's, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, very good point. Well, with your, I want to ask you about that. Is is curanderismo uniquely Mexican? No, uh, not it, at all. Where, where all, it it, all that's just a Spanish word for healing, uh-huh. folk healing. That's all it is. Mm-hmm. Curanderismo is folk healing, mm-hmm. and so you find it throughout Mexico, Central America, South America, the Caribbean, mm-hmm. Puerto Rico, which no longer exists today, unfortunately. But you find, I mean, I once went to to San Juan, Puerto Rico, for the sole purpose of interviewing the most popular curandera on the island. Mm -hmm. And I did that, it was very tricky, and I'll tell you the way I did that, because I didn't have any, I wasn't announced, Mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't invited, I just showed up. Mm -hmm. But that's what that is. I mean, it's just a term that refers to a folk healer or folk medicine, Mm -hmm. which you find in every culture. But here in Mexico, wasn't it a blend of indigenous rituals sure, with of what course. was brought in from Spain? Yes, that's mm-hmm. because in Mexico, you have indigenous populations, m- many still today. Mm-hmm. I have many, many friends who are Native American, Native Mexicans, mm-hmm. and they have all their um, practices and their beliefs, and 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 then they they. Curanderismo today is very much a blend, Mm -hmm. a blend of the ancient and the modern, of, you know, the the curanderas that are really with it will go go to Mexico to buy antibiotics and other medicines and then either give or sell them to their to their patients or prescribe them. For their oh. for their patients. Yeah, absolutely. They're not done. They're not dummies. Yeah. So so today it's a blend mm-hmm. of many, many traditions, including European and Spanish from Me- Mexico, M- Native Americans and so forth. Yeah. Well it's like if you go up to let's say Maine. You'll find people that are, even though they live around Boston, for instance, yeah. around the most modern medicine, they'll go seek alternative medicine. Of course, absolutely. Herbs and all, absolutely. All, yeah. they'll, go, they'll go to healers. That, that's right. There was a time, you know, after the Carlos Castaneda books, which I'm sure you're familiar with, oh, those, yes. where I wanted to have, this is way back in the early 70s, mm-hmm. I wanted to have those experiences. Mm-hmm. And so I went to a little town, a little, not even a town. Uh, here to the west of us, where the, I don't know if you know about this, where the Native Americans would come every year to, to harvest 
to buy peyote and have peyote ceremonies and and take it back to Arizona, New Mexico. In Texas? Yes, absolutely. It's called Miranda City. No, I didn't know. Absolutely. It's, oh. been, it's south of Falfurius and north of Laredo. If you look, uh-huh. you Google it, you'll find Miranda City. Uh-huh. And it's just a little village. Yeah. And but peyote should, grows there? Or what? Peyote grows there? Why, why do Absolutely. they come, all over, they come the place, together? all over the place. And so I showed up there one day with with Letty. You remember Letty? Mm-hmm. Showed up there one day to... And, and I told them what I wanted. And they ushered me into the house because the chief, the head guy, who was going to perform the ceremony that night, was in the house preparing so they ushered me in to talk to him uh-huh. and said, well, you have to talk to him, and if he agrees, then we'll let you participate. And so I went in there, and I talked to him, and I told him who I was. And at one point, he asked me, he said, well, why, why should we trust you? Because they've been burned lots of times, right? Mm, I'm sure. And I said to him, it just, just like this, I said, look into my heart. Look into my heart and you'll see. And he did. And man, all the doors flung open. And I was, uh, uh, Letty slept in the car all night, uh, her little rabbit. I was in the tent with uh, doing peyote with the Indians uh, all night long. It was quite an experience. So I've done all that kind of stuff. The, my, and, you know, I've been in, in Puerto Rico and I haven't been to Cuba, but I've mm-hmm. done all the Santeria. That's why mm-hmm. I was so knowledgeable about San, the uh, Santa, yeah. Santeria when, with the Mark Kilroy thing. I knew you were the real deal. Not that I didn't suspect it before, <laughs> but I knew you were the real deal when National Geographic came to look for you. Well, that's and right. They wanted your expertise that's to right. understand this. That's right, and they did a uh, film that I'm in. Yeah. Uh, the, no, I, the, I am. There's no nothing phony about it. I've had... Uh, I mean, I have several people Mm -hmm. hounding me right now that want different things, Mm -hmm. but uh, I've done all this stuff. I've really done it. You you are absolutely authentic. You have have street cred. Well, thank you. I do. do. (laughs) I've earned the the right. What I've recommended, I may may have actually sick some of these hounds on you. I think you have, but that's okay. People ask me, I say, where where can I get this or that? Where can I learn about this? I say, well, the world's leading expert happened to live right here. Uh, so. Well, thank you. I appreciate that because uh, many of those people have come uh, to visit me and I've done mm-hmm. interviews and mm-hmm. other kinds of things with them. Yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate that. No, you've mm-hmm. been a great mm-hmm. manager. <laughs> Managing well, one, well, one of the things I, I wanted to talk about also is, uh, you know, you, you like you said, you were a poor professor at TSC. And then, Very poor. And, but you've been with this institution itself because you, you're now on the board of TSC. And second term. Second term. Congratulations. Thank you. I wanted to, to know, what is your vision of the future for, not just TSC, but Brownsville? What, what would you like to see it become? Well, I'd like to see Brownsville develop. The most important thing that Brownsville could do is develop more job opportunities, high-tech mm-hmm. and well-paying job opportunities for our, our, our students. Mm-hmm. You know, because so many of our kids have to move away yeah. uh, because there's nothing or there's little here for them but hopefully with SpaceX and other related industries uh, that are here and coming here they'll be able to to stay and so I want I mean I, I push and very successfully Texas Southmost College into offering technology technological programs mm-hmm. because you know even though non-technological programs are important mm-hmm and becoming better paid, technological programs are even better. And so that's what I, that's my emphasis. And so I want to see Brownsville become, you know, a, 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 a city. I don't want us to be known as the poorest city in the country. Mm-hmm. You know, I want us to develop some, some capital, mm-hmm. some equity. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's happening. I do too. I think it's happening. Yeah. It's a, 
It's like as I say, uh, it's a big ship. It takes a while to turn it, but I think the seeds are planted yeah. for yeah. for that sort of future. That's uh, right. Of course, uh, SpaceX has the potential of being an, uh, a uh, major attractor. That's right. Of, of this sort of. We've thing. had our problems with people that we trusted, mm-hmm. who violated our trust and mm-hmm. tried to sell us out. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but we've been able so far to overcome those things, and we're going forward. I was out by iTech the other day. I had them out there in some time. It looks very nice. We put it, it looks very we nice. We put several millions mm-hmm. of dollars into renovation mm-hmm. because you know the the J C Penney's area, mm-hmm. the Dillard's area had not been rented because they were they had roofing problems and they were mm-hmm. falling down. But we put millions of dollars into correcting that so that we can attract. Uh, companies and industry into those facilities. Those are mm-hmm. major spaces. Mm-hmm. The Dillard space, do you remember that? The oh, yeah. yeah. J.C. Penney space yeah. down that end. Uh, we need to we need to have it all fully mm-hmm. occupied. Mm-hmm. Well, you have uh, programs in there, right? We do. Now, right? Yeah. yeah, we do. Yeah, it's, uh, I agree with you that, I mean, I don't know if this is the argument you're making, but it's one uh, that, that I've believed for a long time, that the four-year degree has been oversold, that we need more technical training. Well, uh, because, you know, those, the world needs plumbers. No, it's true. <laughs> I agree with that. But, oh. you know, yeah, although it hasn't been announced, and, mm-hmm. and you probably don't know, but... Mm-hmm. Texas Southmost College has been authorized to offer a four-year, four-year degree, degree right. yeah. in, in applied technology. That's wonderful. It is wonderful because the kids that are in these technology programs but and would like to stay in them but no, don't really have an opportunity to go anyplace mm-hmm. uh, will. And so I, that'll probably be one of my major legacies. When to, will, that's do my you have program. an idea when that will come online? Well, I, mm. well it has to happen in the next few years mm-hmm. because uh, I won't be around for a third term. Mm-hmm. I've got six years. I just started, and I got to get it down done. So we have to. Uh, but uh, times are hard right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, even though our enrollment has not dropped, it's it's tough. It's tough for kids to go to school. Mm-hmm. They have to work to support their families. Uh, but it, I, I see it happening in the next three or four years. Well, that'd be a wonderful thing. It would be, and and if it can, if it can be dovetailed with uh, the, the hopeful development of technological need that's at right. SpaceX and well, there's got to be there's got to be jobs yeah. for them. Mm-hmm. But for already them we have a, a greater uh, opportunity for kids to stay. I mean, there's the, the valley wide offerings are better than they were, you know, 30 years ago. Very it's true. come a long way. Yeah, so, it's very true. So hopefully this will empower that movement and continue it. Yes. That'll be a great legacy. Yeah. Thanks a lot for coming in and chatting well, thank with you. us, Tony. Are Good to see done? you, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you have, well, I'm, we're not necessarily done. I know you had to go and we're approaching no, 12. No, I'm fine. Okay. So the, 53. I'm just trying uh, to think of what we... Because we can splice all this stuff. It doesn't matter. Yeah, just keep exactly. Going. Just well, keep going. Let's, talk, you talk, let's about. talk for a second about this book. Okay. You know, I've mm-hmm. always been interested in in mental health. Mm-hmm. Where is it? Right here, mental health. And, you know, the, o- the overwhelming majority of what curanderas do mm-hmm. today it could be described as counseling. Mm-hmm or mental mental health therapy for people who do not have the ability to go to doctors Mm -hmm. or see psychiatrists or psychologists. And so what I what I the intention of this book and it's been modestly successful. uh, I haven't pushed it too much because I've been ill, Mm -hmm. almost died, uh, is to show people the relationship between men, the practice of mental health, mm-hmm. mental health practitioners, and curanderismo, and try and get them to talk to one another and see the value mm-hmm. of of one another. What they do, and mm-hmm. that's what I'm trying. That's what I try to do. Well, that's an interesting point. Do when most people go to see a curandero, yeah, 
uh, w- would you say that uh, that it breaks out like 50% is about physical and 50% is about uh, mental? Uh, no, no, I'd say 80% mm-hmm. is psychological, psychological, emotional, yes. Mm-hmm. Dealing with love problems, yeah, marital yeah, all problems. All that stuff, yes. And, and why does a person choose to go to the curandera as opposed to the counselor well, other they than go, money? Well, the primary answer is culture. Uh-huh. And that when, when people are in trouble or looking for help, Mm-hmm. in a marriage or, or whatever, they ask people, in fact, and usually their elders, the mm-hmm. grandmothers and so forth, what do I do, where do I go? And they'll say, well, go see La Hermana Maria, you know. She'll talk to you and she'll mm-hmm. help you. And so it's cultural. Uh, that they feel comfortable with that. They feel comfortable with it. And it's successful. Mm-hmm. And, and curanderas often have... Uh, the client, I'll call them clients, uh-huh. uh, I don't want to call them patients, but the clients of curanderas will will stay for a lifetime. They'll keep coming back mm-hmm. because it provides just like you would with your physician mm-hmm. because or your psychologist because it provides them with support. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I suppose I would guess that they spend more time with you. That, that, as oh, opposed definitely. To your, your, oh, your, Right, a and lot so of they, time. They're That's right. Exactly. Because they spend more time. They, there's, they're better uh, listeners. They spend more time. Uh, they, they're more loving. Mm-hmm. Demonstrate empathy. They ask you to come back. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. That's right. As opposed well, to your so typical that just counselor who says that I'm. That's right. Uh, that's 15 minutes now. So we're yeah. <laughs> we're done here. Yeah. No. <laughs> so so this book. Let me let me see it so I can read the title. So the, this this you can get on Amazon. Yes. Curandero. Yes. Hispanic ethnopsychotherapy and curanderismo, which makes the case that you're making right now. Right? Yes. And treating Hispanic mental health in the 21st century. That's right. This is, and you can get this on Amazon. Yes. For all my books are on Amazon. Let me show you. They're all there together. They're all there. All you got to do is look up uh, Antonio Zavaleta, and it'll, all your books come up there together. That's exactly right. Well, actually, I think the most popular book you have because of its is which its one? functionality is the one no, that where you. There's no internet here. Okay, where, is where, what? Where you, the one where you, you list all the herbs oh, that, yes. uh, that are available well, for various. Well, that's exactly right, and that's yeah. in English and Spanish. Yeah. It's a pharmacopoeia of all it's your a options pharmacopoeia in, of all in that Spanish stuff. and English. That's correct. So it's a wonderful. I would wonderful listen book. to radio programs where the commentator uh, was interviewing somebody, and they couldn't, they didn't know the Spanish term for a, an herb mm-hmm. or whatever. And I'd get on the phone, call him, <laughs> dummy. It's blah blah. blah. Uh, but I, what I tried to do in that book very successfully is list them all. Uh-huh. Now, one of, the, one of the extras in this book, this book has 50 pages. Well, first, first of all, it has pertinent doctoral dissertations mm-hmm. from the 1950s all the way to the present. Mm-hmm. And then it has 50 pages of, uh, of bibliography mm-hmm. right there. Expanded bibliography on curandismo and psychology and Hispanic health. So anybody, I mean, this is this book is very valuable for students mm-hmm. and faculty mm-hmm. because you don't have to spend hours in the library looking for re- references. References, it's all, all here. right there. Mm-hmm. So someone and who's going to start on a dissertation or something, they could pick this it's up. It's all and right there. They've got a good start That's exactly right there. Right. Yeah. Well, you know what I like about your books? It really is, uh, the content is beautiful, but the stories within them oh, are, what, are what just propel me right along the stories of, of your own travels yes. and the stories of the curanderos and, and the various things. That's right. Like, like for, uh, Nino Fidencio, yes. when you talked about his treating of uh, the president of Mexico. That's right. And now he, he went into kind of seclusion and he, and was right. and was allowed to treat him. And in was incommunicado for like a, yeah. an hour or so, and his age were he's starting to get a little worried. And until he can't, you know, there was no water. The mountain range is about twenty miles to the northeast of Espinoso, and there's a spring up there. And what the the president. Caius asked the Nino, what do you want? What would you like? And he said, water. So he directed his guys to build 
a pipeline from the spring up on the mountain 20 miles into Espinoso. Uh, and to this very day, that's where they're, that's the only water they have. Wow. Yeah. That was his uh, kind of his uh, gift. His gift for that's the right. healing. That's exactly mm-hmm. right. What did what was wrong with the president? What did he have? Do you know? Well, it's only rumors. Nobody mm-hmm. really knows. Some people think he was a le- had leprosy, and uh-huh. uh, we really don't know what he had. The Nino Fidencio, and you know, I come from Fal Furious. And, sure, and, it's right there. And, and we had uh, uh, Don Pedro the, the Aramillo, who was yes. the, the well-known healer from there. Very well known. And, and he used lots of mud. Did, did yes. Nino Fidencio yeah, use mud? Yeah, he used mud. Sure, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, now I can tell you that he had a, a mud hole. Mm-hmm. And people would get in and bathe and get all muddy, and I never could do that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's why I, I drew the line. I said, not going mean, to do that. I, I can't, I can't, I'm not going to do that. I'm afraid to do that. <laughs> so I didn't. So you were afraid to do it because it's just muddy? I was afraid it was going to, I was going to get some disease it or, so, yeah. or something. You know? well, I guess so, yeah, but there's been sure. a few people in there. <laughs> well, that's exactly right, so I, I didn't do it. Yeah, well, those are uh, interesting rituals that yeah. they have. And, yeah. and, and is that to you, is is that just part of the psychological healing? You have a recipe, you do this, and this will get you better? Or do you think I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, is it actually something in the mud that's healing you? Oh, like a like no, a, it's like right a the mud. The mud is healing. The mud is healing. Okay. Yes, yes. I, I was I, I was thinking it's a psychological the, ritual. Well, also, also, also the mm-hmm. belief because mm-hmm. it's all a, a combination of mm-hmm. the treatment and the belief. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the mud is is yeah. You know, I can tell you that they bring that mm-hmm. mud from a uh, an origin spot. A few miles away, and I went there to see it because I wanted to see it. And I put my hand in it, and I got an electrical shock. I put my really? hand in the water, and uh. I got shocked. <laughs> so, man, that made a believer out of me oh, yeah. right there. But I still wasn't going to get in it, <laughs> regardless, shock or no shock. Well, I, I I remember once that you told me. Uh, you said this is years and years ago, but you you said uh, I've seen things in my travels and my watching of curanderos that make your hair stand on end. That's right. Well, the things that like the things uh, that do that or have done that to me have been the casting out of demons, the mm-hmm. exorcisms, and so. My friend Alberto Salinas, who was a curandero in Edinburgh and has died, uh, he would see people, they'd bring people to him that were allegedly possessed by a demon, and they were going through all the stuff that you see on television. I mean, the television recreates it very well. Mm. And that always, I mean, I could never bring myself to get too close to that. You know, because I was afraid, as the belief is, that we come into it you. would jump to me, mm-hmm. you know, and I didn't want that. So you would be in the room with him when yeah, he was doing this? Yeah, very often oh. I'd be in the room, but then I'd have to back out a little <clears throat> bit uh, because of fear. Uh-huh. Yeah. So I saw a lot of that. Well, speaking of fear, that that's also one of the major things people go to a Conadera for, is, yeah. is to have the fear treated. Well, yeah, to be susto. The susto. That's yeah. right. And that, and that, but is that fear as I understand it, or is that uh, kind of a, a shock that stays Could with you? Could it be you? all of the above? All of the above, huh? Yeah, because I know that I've had to be treated for susto several times. Really? And I know that there were things that happened to me or, or, or things that I witnessed or participated in that bothered me, shocked me so much so that, that I just wasn't myself. Okay. And I had to go to a curandero. So you couldn't get past it. To get, to get past mm-hmm. it to be cured of susto. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. I remember the first time I learned about susto is from you. Oh. 
you and I, yeah. you may not remember this, this is 30 years ago, we were we were taking some students down into Mexico, yeah. there were about 15 of them, and one of those kids was driving, but he had two close calls of accidents, and, uh, and he was shaky, you know, from these almost accidents. And you told me, he said, it, that evening we were at the hotel, you said, I gotta take him to take care of this susto because he's just, yeah, uh, he, that's he, right. he's a mess. Yeah. And that's the first time I ever- And, and I did ever I, did I do yes, that? Yes, you did, you, yeah. you said, you said he's not gonna be worth a damn on this trip until we get this taken care of. Well, that's exactly uh, right. That's exactly right. I'm so, a firm believer so, in that. So that was the first time I ever yeah. I ever learned it. We were down um, I'm gonna we say were down at Ciudad Victoria when uh, you when you oh, when you took him. So you probably about, knew somebody there. We weren't too far off the track. Uh, yeah. We were going down. We, we eventually ended up uh, in Michoacan. Yeah. In Michoacan. Yep. Michoacan yep. San Miguel. On I was going to say uh, Michoacan. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember that trip. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, my friend. And, and, well, thank you for coming well, in. All, I really oh, appreciate sure. it. It's always, always wonderful to see you. Nice. Listen, I don't have anything to do. I'm, a, I'm working on my book now, which uh -huh. otherwise I watch Ancient Aliens. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I can watch 12 straight hours of Ancient Aliens. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't I do not do much. What makes, mm -hmm. makes Gabby crazy. <laughs> Because she wants me to go do something. You know, she's now Dr. Gabby. Yes. She finished yes. her PhD. Yeah, yeah I kind of watch, uh, as you watch my family, I watch yours the same sure, way. Sure, sure. You get to see how these things. Absolutely. Y'all take great pictures together, baby. Oh, and thank Gabby. you. Y thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful photos. Now, you're, uh, I was hearing this Mexican talk the other day, just kind of a little comedian. He was talking about, he said, you know, in Egypt, he said, they always talk about who made the pyramids, who made those for them. He said, they never say that about Mexicans because they they know Mexicans can build. <laughs> and he well, said, so they never claim that the Mexicans didn't make their own pyramids. And he said, we knew because we had a quinceanera coming up and we had to, we had to finish it. <laughs> That's probably true. Okay. So are you one of those who believes, I mean, do you believe that the Egyptians didn't build their pyramids? I do not. Mm -hmm. I believe that the pyramids in Egypt are, mu are thousands of years older than Egyptian culture. Oh. I think this has been proven. Thousands of years mm -hmm. older and were built by an unknown culture. Mm -hmm. They're finding today, they're finding some of the, they're, they're finding that the pyramids are like conductors of electricity and they have in them uh, all kind of, they, for example, they found a, a basement, a bottom portion that was unknown. They found it recently of mercury, liquid mercury in there. Wow. And then the mercury combined with the quartz and everything, it's, it, it, it becomes a reactor, it becomes a light bulb. And, and, they, and so the ancient Egyptians didn't do that. Uh, some other culture, ancient culture, I'm not going to say they were aliens, but somebody did it. It's so you think somebody. the Egyptians kind of moved in and claimed them? Yeah, as their just own? like in Mexico, yeah. the Aztecs didn't build, yeah. didn't build anything. It was mm -hmm. all, well, they built the ones in Mexico City. Right. But the the big site out at Teotihuacan, that's mm -hmm. that's not Aztec. Mm -hmm. That was that was there. It's been there for thousands of years. But, and we don't know who it is. Huh? We don't, no, we don't know who no, built we don't it, have really. any idea. And Before those, the old and those are the biggest, right, in Mexico? The, the big ones. The Teotihuacan, those are the yeah, biggest ones yeah, in yeah, Mexico. Yeah. The Pyramid of the Sun, the Pyramid mm -hmm. of the Moon. Yeah. I've, I've, we have no idea who built that. I walked up to the top, and, yeah. and I've said this to myself. That's <laughs> good. <laughs> got yeah. oxygen. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for watching this BSPA video. Go ahead and hit like and subscribe if you like what you see. And if you really like what you see, go ahead and go to our website brosoperformingarts.org and smash the donate button and then we'll really like you too.